Watch this. I agree that we need to do all that we can to protect our frontline workers, the elderly, and those who are compromised health-wise. But I also believe it's important that we protect our economy. And I don't think that those two goals need to be mutually exclusive. That is Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan speaking with the Cross Politic podcast last week. It's a religious oriented show based out of Moscow, Idaho. And in it, she spoke about how Idaho has handled the COVID-19 crisis. And as you just heard, why she thinks at this point we're doing it wrong. And by we, she means Governor Brad Little. The lieutenant governor has not been silent in her disapproval of deeming some businesses as essential and others not. She's also been urging Idahoans to defy the governor's order to reopen the state in stages. She's taken part in several rallies recently, both in person and online, to try to get the governor to reconsider and open everything right now. Her recent newsletter tells about her escapades from a Liberate Idaho rally at the Capitol last Friday to helping open hardware brewing in Kendrick later that same day. By the way, that's GOP Chairman Raul Labrador on the right, standing with her in that picture with the owners of the bar. The bar was opening, by the way, a month and a half earlier than Governor Little's stage four recommendation. Showing you these pictures and this video is our way of saying we did reach out to the Lieutenant Governor to ask about these things and invite her to speak to us on camera. She respectfully declined, saying she is focused on helping local business owners as they prepare to reopen. But she did spend 20 minutes on a podcast talking about the backlash, backlash that is, she has seen after speaking out against Governor Little's plan that would push the complete reopening of Idaho businesses to the end of June and why hearing that criticism doesn't really bother her. Anybody questions what's happening today, then we're all branded as being extreme and heretic. I've yeah. been challenged yeah. of being, you know, why are you the lieutenant governor not supporting the governor? Um, well, first of all, I'm a cons duly elected constitutional officer right. uh, elected by the people of Idaho. I report to the people of Idaho. Yeah. That doesn't mean that the governor and I agree on everything. And when we do disagree, I will speak my mind. So what about that governor, lieutenant governor working relationship that we all just assume is an open line of communication? Lieutenant Governor McGeehan says that's not necessarily the case. For example, she says a week before the stay at home order was set to expire, when Idaho went 14 days with declining numbers of new confirmed coronavirus cases, McGeehan says she sent a message to Governor Little. So I messaged Governor Little and I said, look, Governor, we happy. Oh, happy day. We meet these guidelines from from the president. You could right now today declare that we're in phase one of reopen. Yeah. I didn't get a response from that. To be totally honest with you, at this point, the um, relationship between the governor's office and my office is is tense. To I, say. I was going to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tense relationship right now. It I over a period of weeks. Yes, I was. I have been involved in getting receiving daily updates from the governor's staff, but I've never been a part of of the decision making circle. My advice has never really been asked for. It's never sure. been taken. McGeehan went on to say that, yeah, this tension and lack of communication, as you heard, has been going on for weeks, and she says she's not the only one concerned with who the governor has surrounded himself these days and with who he is listening to. Those are his words, her words, excuse me. She says she's heard the same from several Idaho lawmakers. So what does the governor think of all this? He's been asked several times and has avoided a direct answer saying everyone is entitled to their opinion. Well, we asked for a specific answer today and we've yet to hear back. Same goes for Raul Labrador, former comics congressman, now party chair, who went along with McGee to that brewery opening up north. Haven't heard back from him either. We do want to mention there is an open invitation for McGeehan, Little or Labrador to come on the 208 and answer any of these questions. And if they do, we'll be sure to bring that to you. Maybe tomorrow. Oh, other divisions in the state house include the obvious the Democrats and the Republicans. And you heard McGeehan mention that there are other voices speaking out against the governor. On Friday, House Minority Leader Democrat Ilana Rebell 
Elena Rebell, excuse me, said she believed that the legislature dropped the ball on the end of the 2020 session. Well, not everyone agrees with that, including Majority Caucus Chair Republican Megan Blanksma. Joe Paris spoke with Blanksma about why she feels lawmakers did what they could. And she also, she also gives us a look at the 21, 2021 session. Since the end of the 2020 legislative session, there's been criticism about how the session came to an end and how lawmakers handled it. Democrats have said that the Republican majority spent too much time on social issues like banning transgender athletes from sports. Majority Caucus Chair Megan Blanksma says from her perspective, though, lawmakers were trying their best under the circumstances. I don't know that there would have been a better way. I, I wish there was. I think we all left feeling uncomfortable and feeling like we didn't truly accomplish everything that we would necessarily wanted to accomplish during the legislative session in our hurry to get through the budget bills. Blanksma says, like other lawmakers, she's heard a lot from her constituents about Governor Little's stay home order and rebound Idaho plan. I think that there is a little bit of arbitrariness on which businesses can be open. And so it'd be nice to kind of smooth that out. I think so that I think there's some valid opinions there and, and some things to talk about. Blanksma says she understands the health concerns of opening up Idaho, but for the most part, she believes Idahoans have shown they can be responsible. I understand people have concerns about um, this whole thing flaring up again, and I get it, and, and it should be a concern, but I also think we asked Idahoans to act responsibly for a good long time. Blanksma has heard from her constituents about the need to reopen business there. One business field in particular, though, has continued to come up, and that's cosmetology. It's because of the licensure issue. I mean, it's one thing for a restaurant to say that I'm going to open, you know, and from what I'm understanding from health districts is they're not going to find them. They're just going to give them suggestions on how to operate responsibly. Looking ahead to the 2021 legislative session, Blanksman knows there are tough decisions ahead. I think in particular, the budget is just going to be a major issue and, and trying to figure out how to cope with the loss of business that we've had over the last several weeks. It's only going to continue. With regard to education, we did the spending package. Now we're finding that we're going to have to have a rescission on everything. So that, that changes the focus of, of how you look at education in Idaho. All right, so Joe McGeehan mentioned in that podcast last week that she wants legislators to address that section of Idaho code that allows the governor to take such control in times of crisis. But through your conversations with lawmakers, do you get the feeling for what will be that big issue coming up in 2021? Well, there's a lot of representatives and senators that want to go back and readdress how everything went down at the end of the session in terms of the emergency declaration order, as well as how they could be involved in future situations like this. In terms of a topic that will be on the House or Senate floor, uh, your guess is good as anybody else's. A lot of the budgets having to be restructured can really present some problems. Uh, the lawmakers I've talked with say, of course, education has to continue to be a priority. The question is, what type of budget is left? And also, Brian, we talked about this on Friday. There's a lot of lawmakers that have primaries and also mm -hmm. they have the fall general election. It's tough to say right now who could be sitting in all those seats in January. So lawmakers also have to worry uh, about getting back to the state house themselves. That's true. It's all going to kind of play out here over the next several months, but money is going to be a big factor when it comes to the next session. All right. Thank you, Joe. Speaking of money, well, it's the first of the month and you might be well within that window, that leeway you get to pay that mortgage or that rent. Yeah, well, it's due for a lot of Idahoans. There's a double whammy for some renters though. Beginning this week, eviction hearings are resuming. Kim Fields has a look at what could be the beginning of an even bigger crisis. I'm stressed because I have to pay a late fee now because I haven't gotten my stimulus yet. Um, I don't know when it's going to be delivered. So. Summer Johnson is stressed. She, like so many others, are concerned about paying rent. And I know that I'm not alone in it. And as I said, that a lot of people were like, please be the voice because we're all very frustrated. So what are you hearing? How many calls are you getting for help? We were in a housing crisis before all this happened. And so we were hearing from about five to 10 new families per day. And now we're hearing from around 20 to 30 new families per day who need rental assistance. Ali Rabi is executive director of Jesse Tree, a nonprofit that provides support to people at risk of eviction. And they've lost their jobs. They're used up their savings and they're now in a place where they can't pay their rent. 
The Idaho Supreme Court put a hold on eviction hearings on all court hearings after Governor Little first issued the stay-at-home order on March 25th. But now those hearings are resuming, leaving some renters facing an even bigger crisis. For this week alone, there are 32 hearings in Ada County that we know of and five in Ken County. Last time we checked. 32 eviction hearings in Ada County alone for this week. Under Idaho law, property managers and landlords could begin the eviction process if a renter is just three days late on rent. You know, they'll financially never recover from that. They're going to have to have eviction on their, their record and their credit goes down. They have no money and it just it, it's a long term situation more than short term right now. What do you tell people? We're trying to support as many people as possible. We do have rental assistance available as well as supportive services from our social workers. And so we're trying to get the word out in the community that Jesse Tree has those resources available. So they should call our housing crisis line and we can give them some advice. So you just would like to see a little bit more understanding when it comes to property managers and landlords? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Understand, like, put themselves in, in our shoes and what it feels like. Washington's governor last month issued a temporary statewide moratorium on evictions and freezes on rent hikes. City of Boise, Ada County, Jesse Tree, and several other nonprofits have all encouraged Governor Little to do the same. Jesse Tree says they haven't heard back from Governor Little's office, and we haven't either. In the meantime, here's what you can do if you are struggling to pay the rent. Jesse Tree says to communicate with your landlord. Be as open as you can be about your finances and what's possible for you. Sometimes a conversation is the first step to getting things settled. Try to set up a payment plan ahead of time. Jesse Tree's housing crisis hotline is also available at the number on your screen. Well, Summer was able to set up a payment plan with her property manager who said they're trying to be as accommodating as possible with all their tenants, which is good news for Summer and hopefully for some of you out there, you might be able to work out the same situation. Idaho's most famous crop is looking a little tougher on this May the 4th. Must be the helmet. And no public pools will open in the city of Boise this year. But why? I mean, chlorine cleans things, right? As always, the text line is always open. Make sure to send us your questions, your comments, even your complaints. 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. We're going to read some of what you send in at the end of the show.
It's May the 4th, as in May the 4th be with you. Yep, it's Star Wars Day. The one day all Galaxy Far, Far Away fans hold dear. 43 years ago this month, George Lucas released the original Star Wars movie, A New Hope. Well, there's not a huge Idaho connection to the Star Wars universe, but there is at least one. And wouldn't you know it, it has to do with a potato. Right about the time the third installment of the second trilogy was being released back in 2005, we went on a journey to the dark side, and it's tonight's May the 4th edition of the 208 Redial. The original Mr. Potato Head was really just plastic pieces stuck in real potatoes, which were probably from Idaho. It took 12 years to get an actual body, and he eventually grew an entire family of spuds, all with interchangeable parts. Mr. Potato Head has always been about changeability. He can be any face he wants to. And we thought, what fun to have Mr. Potato Head become Darth Vader this year. That's right. After 53 years, this toy tuber has gone to the dark side, a design born of a Hasbro company brainstorming session. We actually had an employee contest, and several employees dressed him up as Darth Tater. This was a couple years ago. But the idea for Darth Tater dates back long, long ago. Any idea what that is? Darth Tater, duh. I think I've seen it before. You have, I've seen something like it. In fact, he's been an icon of Idaho since the beginning. He's been around as long as the movie has. We just dug him up in 94. Mark Sherrod of Western Image says they created the caricature to sell t-shirts. You guys were first. Absolutely. Darth Tater born right here in, in uh, Boise, Idaho in 1994. No question about that. You know, as, as we say on our t-shirt design, you know, long, long ago in a potato field far, far away, um, that's where Darth Tater came from. And over the years, the company has come up with many other potato parodies. Oh, we came up with uh, um, Arnold Schwartz and Tater. There's Spud Bob starch pants, even Harry Potato, but none as popular as this one. It's been our number one selling t-shirt since 1994, year in and year out. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, it's awful cute. Just not original. Um, we know we came up with it first. What have the Hasbro people to say about that? I hadn't actually heard. You're the first one that's telling me that, that they've been out in the market for a few years now. And for many years to come, because as they say at Western Image, we've been very successful because the uh, farce is with us. So. <laughs> Brian Holmes, Idaho's News Channel 7. Okay, so Western Image, they went out of business a few years ago, sold to a company in Arizona. But the Darth Tater logo given to Cindy Fogdell, the owner of Tater's, the Idaho souvenir shop downtown. That was way back in 2016. And Cindy says the T-shirt, yep, remains her most popular item that she sells in the store. The logo, though, also adorns magnets and mugs, as you can see. She told us she has yet to hear from either Disney or Hasbro about the parody, probably because it is just that parody and thus falls under the fair use portion of the Copyright Act. You can get a Darth Tater Mr. Potato Head out there in stores and online right now, but just remember the idea started with the Spud State. Roaring Springs, they say they're planning on opening up this summer, so why are the city of Boise pools keeping their gates locked? That warmer pool weather will be here before you know it. Well, I mean, Brie Eggers knows when, and she'll tell you. Don't forget, we want to know what you have to say about the show, what we've talked about, what you want us to talk about, about anything, really. 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. Be part of the conversation. We'll respond to some later in the show.
May the 4th be with you. Yeah, it's Monday, May 4th, and we're cruising through the first week of May, if you can believe it. Hard to keep track of time these days. Temperatures running in the upper 60s and low 70s for places like Ontario at 71 right now. We have lots of sunshine to enjoy today, and the warming power of that sunshine is getting so much stronger as we kick off solar summer, the three months of the year when we have the strongest sun angle over the northern hemisphere. So you'll notice it'll warm our temperatures up more quickly as the day goes on. We're also still seeing an increase in daylight as we cruise through the month of May. Now, high pressure and control currently, but low pressure system out over the ocean is going to sweep a cool front through our area as we move into Wednesday. That'll increase our wind speeds. While we enjoy the sunshine for the rest of today and tomorrow as well, the UV index is at an eight, which is very high in the scale. So advising, I know it's one of those things that we know very well, that we grab the SPF 30 at least and reapply every couple of hours because a sunburn can happen within 15 minutes when we're talking sunshine that's that strong. That's the case again tomorrow as we get closer to 80 degrees, a little bit cooler on Wednesday as that cool front sweeps through for us. It looks like valley locations should stay dry as the cool front comes through the area. Showers and storms really more for the mountain locations, but we will see the wind really pick up on Wednesday. Another windy Wednesday in store for us as it's a transition day and gusts could get up to 30, 35 miles per hour. Of course, stronger south and east of Boise. As I mentioned before, showers, thunderstorms, a good likelihood for our higher elevations, especially to our northern zones. And here's a look at the seven-day forecast, spelling it out day by day. Temperatures all over the place as we make it through this spring season, but warming up to more summer-like conditions as we cruise into next weekend. You can always find this forecast at ktvb.com. We'll be right back after a quick break. Okay, so this summer is going to mark the season of the most difficult game of Marco Polo ever. You're not allowed to get near anybody. Last week, the city of Boise announced they would not open any of its public pools this year, like at all, because of the pandemic. Meaning kids, at least in Boise, won't be able to head down to their local public pools to cool off from the heat. Well, that prompted this question from Patricia to the 208 Facebook group. 
Curious why pools are not opening soon, as most pools I am aware of have chlorine in them. All right, yes, they do have chlorine in them, and they're not opening, but you're right, Patricia, the chlorine is there, it just doesn't magically kill coronavirus. And if we did, if it did, we'd all just have jumped in a pool by now, right? According to the Water Health and Advisory Council, chlorine provides a residual level of protection against germs in the water, but it's also meant to kill off waterborne illnesses, so it's not necessarily there to protect against all germs and viruses. Doug Holloway, the director for Boise Parks and Rec, says there's a lot of other factors that played into the decision to close the, the, the pools, and he says it really has no bearing on the actual virus living in the water. In fact, it actually can't live in a pool setting, but it's more of just about getting a large number of kids or adults or anybody together in one location for a length of time, and that's certainly something of concern. He also said the decision part, partly due in, to financials and logistics, meaning things like cleaning bathrooms, showers, lockers, plus hiring and training a staff to monitor social distancing rules. It all adds up. As of right now, no other cities have announced plans to close their public pools, but that could change. And even Roaring Springs says they plan to open at some point this summer, and we should find out when sometime mid-May. We'll be right back. After a car wreck, why should you call Lidster Frost? All right, let's take a look at some of your comments you sent in during the 208 here, starting with this one from Jennifer. Wow, airing dirty laundry much from our lieutenant governor. We don't need to know the minutia of her grievances or that her relationship with our her governor is tense. I would contend maybe we kind of do because she is second in line after all. So if something should happen to Governor Brad Little, then she would step in and kind of take over and then, of course, take over the reins of what we're doing with COVID-19. Why can't have, we have the parks open on the 15th? I believe that's the 25th for Memorial Weekend. That's my taxes paying for them. I don't need Brad Little looking after me. Maybe we all need to go camping on his ranch. It's an option, but I believe that would be stage three when the gatherings can kind of expand to 10 to 50, 50 people and non-essential travel can be kind of lifted. If we're supposed to wear masks in public, why can we not get them? I've tried medical supply places and even Amazon. Try looking locally. There's a lot of people that make them around here. You could probably find them there. 
Hey, 208, I'd like to know if you have any updates on unemployment. I filed five weeks ago and have heard nothing. The only update we can give you is just hold tight. It's coming. We'll see you tomorrow.